Hello there, I'm playing with Chunk again. This time I have a tape library from Attic, respectively Quantum, and it's the model Scholar E6000. This is a modular system. Here, the first rack with the LCD screen is the base unit. Then there is an extension unit that only has slots for more tape cartridges. And then you can add 10, 12, maybe even more racks for more cassettes, more slots. You see, tape backup is still a thing, especially if you want to archive your data for a long time. So, some government regulations sometimes require that you keep your data for 10 times, uh, 10 years or maybe even more. So, that's the cassettes. It's an Ultrium 3 cassette with 800 gigabyte compressed or 400 gigabyte native each. Uh, at the moment we are at Ultrium, I don't know, 6 or 7. Uh, don't ask me about the capacities, I don't know that by heart, but well, that's a lot of capacity. This unit here has uh, it's a touch screen. This unit here has 744 slots now. Zero of them are occupied. Only the mail slot here is used. The mail slot can be used to insert or remove cassettes from the library. So you can tell the robot to place any tape in this slot mechanism here and then you can open that, remove the tape or put the new tape in, whatever you need. That's the second unit. Again, a lot of empty slots in the door and also a lot of empty slots in the back. And the robot mechanism slides on that rail here that can be extended to any number of uh, additional um, uh, rack. You only need a longer timing belt, a longer drive belt here and of course an update in the license of the library, of, uh, a software license that allows you to use all that additional space. That's the belt that drives the robot gripper up and down. Also on the rail with ball bearings. The robot gripper here can rotate to grip cassettes on either side of the library. It has a gripper mechanism here, that's called a hand. Come on. Like this one. You can see the two fingers that grab the cassette. They are designed for uh, the Ultrium tapes. There are different grippers for different tapes, so you can only use one kind of tape in this library. There is also a barcode scanner, which is up here, and everything in this library has its own barcode, even the empty cassette drawers here. You see, there's always six per drawer, and depending on how much money you pay, you can have it with more or less drawers, and that's 
uh, what the library checks at the beginning when you power it up it counts the number of drawers it sees this is a drawer it has that kind of barcode then of course you have tapes we have four tape drives here they also have a barcode to identify them as a uh, LTO drive there are space for two more drives and of course in the expansion unit is also space for more drives so the number of drives and the number of cassettes can be expanded according to your uh, to your budget that's the back side of the main unit you see the back side of the four tape drives they have fiber channel interfaces for data uh, ethernet interface for internal communications within the library there's the power input power supply you can have an additional power supply and an additional power input main circuit breaker that's the robotics controller library controller stuff like that here we have fiber channel interfaces fiber channel switches two of them so all the tapes are connected to the switches and then to the systems to the backup server or wherever you need uh, the data and then on the second cabinet here there is nothing because there are only uh, tape slots in the front it has a small controller here behind the door and uh, that controller only checks if all doors are closed if the end stop uh, of the robot is working stuff like that okay let's take it apart takes a while for the capacitors to get empty okay that's it Silence. Of course, we will not throw away the entire unit. We will keep some uh, parts for spare, and this library here is tested, so everything is working. And the first part. I will save is the gripper here and I hope it comes off with only this two screws yeah it looks like okay that's one connector yeah beautiful a closer look to the robotics this is the uh, what is it x axis or is it the y axis uh, i always confuse the two that's the motor it's a synchronous motor it's not a stepper motor but it has a optoelectronic feedback here uh, an impulse counter that counts the revolutions uh, it has a drive belt to the big wheel here and the smaller wheel then drives the belt with the horizontal arm and for the vertical part that's the motor for the vertical it's the same model of motor that's the encoder that's the motor down here also has two belts one from the motor to the big wheel and then the up and down belt that carries the gripper 
that takes the cassettes with it. On the back side there are the fiber channel uh, switch modules. One, two, three, four, five, six channel, Q logic fiber channel chips, interfacing backplane connector, some RAM, and quite a nice looking board. And the other one is, of course, exactly the same. money shot all the same then we have here library controller I think it's that one yes that looks like there's the library software the firmware some RAM CPU that's more or less a computer with some Broadcom Ethernet chips, DC converter here on board, backside, a lot of stuff, flash RAM also for uh, keeping some data, probably also for the firmware, some parts of the firmware. Then the next card here, that's probably the, uh, the robotics controller, not much on the back side, some specialized chips here, this one has only the job to, um, well to drive the the, the motors and read all the sensors but that's only the the logic part the high current part the power part is on the next board that's this one here so we have a lot of relays for switching all kind of solenoids in the library we have a power module, I think we only have two motors, two big motors, I think that's probably one, that's the other. It looks a little bit like that. Here we have two power stages, also for one and the other, uh, for the vertical and horizontal motors, I think so. Then the gripper itself has only tiny motors, they don't need a lot of current, that's probably those transistors here, I'm not sure. It's a little bit difficult to find detailed uh, information on these things. Yeah, that's the motor driver board. And of course I will also keep the tapes. They are still in good condition. And that's the way how they are removed. They have a connector here for the library to know what the tape is doing, to send commands to the tape like load and unload because normally this is like a standard uh, standalone drive. It has an eject button here but there's no one to press that button, so the eject command, for example, goes over the interface here. It has this special bracket here over the front with the barcode and this white stripe here. That's a calibration mark. So every single drive and uh, cassette compartment is calibrated with it with its exactly exact x and y coordinates so it takes quite a while for the first moment 
when you turn on the library to to get ready because it has to scan all the cassettes and slots and tapes and creates itself a map about these things so that it knows where exactly is which device and it doesn't hit any walls with the cassette that's the power supply High power heat sinks inside, two fans on the other side, and power and control pins here. Yeah, I won't take that apart because I want to keep that as a spare drive, uh, as a spare power supply. the power input module that's not much more than the power input circuit breaker and the connection to the back plane there and an additional socket for well I don't know maybe a Ethernet switch or whatever device you want to put inside the case inside the cabinet here there's an interesting detail on the back plane where the three library control modules are. As you see, they are color coded, and each of these colored uh, plastic uh, things has a, a different physical configuration. So you can't put the wrong board in the wrong position, it simply won't fit. Because I don't want to keep the cabinet itself, it's just a pile of metal that normally doesn't break, so we don't need that as a replacement, as spare parts. So before I can move the entire library here, I have to separate the two uh, racks. And for that, I have to dive into that slot here. to unplug the two cables that come from the other rack. That's a flat cable and the RJ45 cable here. They go over to that controller here, which is in the expansion rack. And then we have to remove a couple of screws to take that apart. Let me show you that. So the first thing I remove is that belt tension block. You can see there's a, a spring inside. Here that part is moving. That tensions the belt. And there is a screw where I can pull that movable part back so the belt becomes loose. So I tightened that screw that pulled the block here to the left side and the belt here is now floppy and loose and I can remove that plate. The next step is then to disconnect the rails.
there are two screws here. It was a bit under tension. You can see it, it has moved here. It shouldn't be. Then there is a screw down here. Tiny screw for such a big machine. And there is another screw on the top rail. And there are of course big screws and bolts that hold the two cabinets together. We have four of them, two in the front and two in the back. And after removing those, the racks can be separated. That's it. Of course, when you join the two cabinets, the feet on the ground here must be adjusted very precisely because if the cabinets don't have the same height and orientation, you will never get the screws through the holes, like here and here. So everything must be level and flat and upright and then you can uh, move them together, screw them together and expand to, well, how many cabinets you want. Next step is to remove the touch panel from the door, so I have no idea how that works. So I begin with removing a lot of dust. These things here. And I see some screws appearing. It seems that's the right way. Let me see if that is so easy. More screws. Okay. Let's remove the screws and we will see what happens. Normally these things are pretty easy to disassemble because they are uh, easy to make maintenance, to replace parts for... Oops, that was the wrong screw. 
but it was only the cosmetic panel that fell down. No problem, no damage. Sorry for that. And now that's the touch panel module. It has one single cable attached here. Goes down to the cable, goes down to the power button, the robotics on and off button, status light, backlight uh, inverter for the LCD panel, of course, and some. Ah, that's the touch flex print from the touch screen here. It's a, one of these plastic foil types, resistive, is that the term? I think so. There's another uh, cable. I think I have to remove that too. They secured it with a tie wrap. So that must be some sort of interface. No, that's only the touch. Where is the screen electronics? Maybe behind the screen? Okay, we will see. And always use the right tool for the right job. So I hope I don't cut the cable the wire. No, nope. that's okay. So last screw. Okay, that's it. Ah, yes, I didn't see that the first time. That's the interface connector that goes to the display itself. So it's a nice big LCD, I'd say 10 inch, 12 inch with touch. We will keep that as a spare too. By the way, some people ask me why I don't wear an anti-static wrist strap like that one. Well, it is very simple. I wear an anti-static shoe strap that goes around my shoe, goes here with this. Uh, conductive ribbon here to my skin here and I'm grounded through the floor which is anti-static here so no problem with static electricity as long as I stand on the floor if I start flying then we have another problem and the last part I want to save is the motor here, the motor there, the entire rail system here. Because I think that are expensive parts if you need them. And I already have a couple of these rails and perhaps for a future project a 
could be nice to have. Yes, so it seems the rotors already come down. Only three screws. There is a, a plug. Okay, that's it. That's the motor with the first drive belt and the second drive belt that goes along the entire library. So I hope I can remove the entire rail here by just sliding it off and it seems to work somehow. There are, there are of course some more cables down here. So I think I have to unplug that first. Well, that's a big connector. I hope you can see that. Yes. Okay. That's cool. doesn't like to be bent on the wrong side. Well, well, that's it. So that's the entire robotic movement assembly. There's the top roll. It just has a, a rectangular rail that goes here and I just see that this wheel here doesn't look very happy I think that ball bearing here yes that's gone that's completely come apart maybe that was the reason why it sounded a bit weird <laughs> I already picked one of the ball bearing balls out here so that has to be replaced anyway. That's the... No, that's not the slider, that's the... Oh, okay. Here are the ball bearings that run inside the horizontal uh, rail. You can see we have two on the left and one in the center that goes to the right. And there is an adjusting screw. You can move the center one force and back to eliminate any uh, free play, make, make it run smooth with no gap. And the same of course here, there are hardened steel inserts where the ball bearing rollers roll on, that's the actual rail there is another one on this side and you can see that the ball bearing wheels they have grooves that fit exactly into that hardened steel uh, rail yes that's how it works that's standard industrial linear motion uh, stuff quite expensive if you need one tolerances are very close so yes you can build some machinery with that And that's how it is working. You see one rail here, one rail here. We have three 
ball bearings with grooves on the wheels. We have felt cleaners and also they have a little bit of uh, oil on it to lubricate the entire thing. Although lubrication is not really necessary, but the oil does also clean uh, the rails and it runs smooth. And it has any free play around that. You simply adjust the screw here. You can see it, it moves the center wheel up and down. There is another screw here, so it's clamped between the two screws and you can adjust it to zero play here and it runs or it also runs that way yeah linear motion well that's it all the cabinet stuff goes to the junkyard and all the electronics and interesting stuff goes back to stock. So, thanks for watching.